Okay. I so so I I, okay. I, I am glad to have a, a, a lecture by Barack Weiss about uh, uh, flows on spaces of lattices. So Barack, you are very welcome. Okay, thank you very much. So please uh, stop me, you know, whenever you need to, uh, quickly as soon as I start. Stop making sense. Uh, so Nikolai, so I, what's the usual? How long usually are are the lectures? Uh, 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 as far as I uh, remember, uh, you have a meeting uh, in uh, two hours. Yes, yeah, I have a. I have a meeting. Oh, you should hours. finish. Yes. Probably you should finish uh, before your meeting, uh, or, or, or earlier. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So, uh, people are okay. Into, okay. Okay. Just checking. and I think they are our community from uh, Technion, from Ratner's uh, seminar from Technion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so I'll uh, start. So I'm gonna let G. Oops. Sorry. G will be SLNR. I'll, I'll I'll set up everything and then I'll tell you what Haynes was using. Uh, gamma will be SLNZ. Uh, A will be the group of n by n diagonal matrices of determinant one. So a diagonal group intersected with uh, G, and then we have an action and, and maybe UIJ also is another group. So these are the main players here. UIJ is a one parameter group. For two indices I and J, which are different numbers between one and N, um, you form, so this, this, this means the matrix that's got a one on the IJ location and zeros everywhere else, and this is the identity. So these are, um, this is also a group, which is isomorphic to the to the real line. This group is isomorphic to n minus one dimensional Euclidean space. So these these two groups are both uh, abelian, and this group is a lattice in this group, which means that the quotient has a um, g invariant measure of finite volume, and g mod gamma the quotient is the space of uh, lattices in Rn of co-volume one, and um, any subgroup of G acts on the left. So in particular, say the group A, sorry, the group A that I mentioned acts on the left or any 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 group subgroup of G acts on the left. And the, um, the uh, correspondence between cosets and lattices are that the lattice of the element G is corresponds to the image of the standard lattice Zn uh, by the linear transformation G. Okay, so is this clear? Just I'm just just want to be sure that this is clear. So this is an element in this space. This is an element in this space. The co-volume is one because the determinant of G is one. That's because G is um, a group. And it's a bijection because this group is the stabilizer of this lattice. There's some uh, there's some background noise. Wait, wait, one moment, one moment. I will try to understand what's happening. Okay. Uh, so if there are, are there questions at this point, just uh, just making sure that we're on on the same page. Okay, so this is this is the situation. And then the Haynes lemma three, what Haynes said in his preprint is the following statement. Uh, um, let uh, uh, alpha one, alpha n um, be generators of a totally real number field K of degree N well Haynes said this uh, in, in dimension three I'll, I'll I'll say this slightly more general thing and, and then I'll go back to dimension three in a second let um, G0 
the uh, the matrix C times sigma I alpha J, I J are from one to N, sigma one up to sigma N are the field embeddings of K in the real numbers and C is chosen so that the determinant so you, is one. you have totally real field all embedding yeah, totally real. real field yeah it's a totally real number field okay um, so if you think about this uh, this matrix is invertible because the field is of degree n and there are n numbers here and then it's a well-known fact that these this matrix um, gives rise to n linearly independent vectors. That if, if if these elements are linearly independent and generate a degree a field of degree n, then this matrix um, has non-zero determinant, and the determinant might be po it's a, these are real numbers, so the determinant might. flip a pair of alpha i's so that the determinant becomes positive. So now this has positive determinant and we can rescale by a positive um, scalar. Actually, um, I, I guess that doesn't matter. Uh, you can always, if n is odd, you can always rescale to make the determinant equal to one. If n is even, you first make the determinant positive and then you multiply by scale so that the determinant is one. So we're assuming that we've rescaled things so that the determinant is one. And then um, we take the point uh, L, which is a lattice in this space, uh, G zero inverse transpose Zn. Uh, this notation means the inverse of the, the inverse of the transpose matrix. So that's the engineering notation, uh, inverse transpose. And, um, or in other words, it's the dual lattice, if you prefer that terminology. And uh, what Haynes was saying, which is a, co a correct statement, is that uh, if uh, n equals three uh, and uh, uij say is u1, uh, I guess he was using the partic one particular group, maybe two, three, Uh, then uh, this orbit is dense. Okay, statement clear? Any questions about the statement? Uh, I think, uh, any questions? Uh, As for me, it is clear. Yes, yeah, okay, wonderful. Uh, oh, I, I okay. have all, all, only one question. Yes. Uh, when you wrote uh, G sub zero, uh, rise it to the minus t power, is it uh, G transpose it? Or rise it to the minus one power, or is it G? This is or... this is notation. So G zero minus T is G zero inverse transpose. Th thank you, thank you. Okay, that's uh, which gives the dual lattice if you if you prefer the terminology of lattices. Uh, okay, so this is the statement of Haynes. Uh, let me. Um, and Haynes uh, cited my paper with Lyndon Strauss, so this uh, so um, so this comes from. So I'm going to present a, a more general result. So theorem A. Oops, sorry. Let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so so uh, so this trajectory mm -hmm. uh, uh, UL. So can you show U once again? Uh, yeah. UIJ. So. Uh, what do we want from t to tend somewhere or no 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 to, uh, uh, in the statement range... t takes all all positive all uh, non zero values you look at this as so a the set. question is can we just uh, 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 make t range through say positive numbers you can make t range through positive numbers that's also in our paper you can make t um i mean this orbit not only is dense but it's also equidistributed so it's actually not only going everywhere, but it's spending somehow the correct proportion of time in any open set in the space. Mm -hmm. There are there are additional properties, but this is what Haynes was was claiming. Yeah, I it, guess it, no, it, you're right. You're right. I guess Haynes was only claiming this for T positive. You're right. 
And it's also uh, true. What if we are. take, say, some some nice subset of R? What would be a nice subset? If uh, your set say is a um, arithmetic progression, I mean, it's not. It's an infinite uh, copy of. Um, as a group, it's isomorphic to Z, or it's a translate of Z, then uh, the same conclusion holds. If it's sparser, there's been some work. For example, you could take T to be so for, for Z, n to the it, power 1.0001, say, something like this. And then there's a result of, uh, a set, I mean, it's not in the literature, but essentially some technique of Venkatesh, if you only sample along a polynomial sequence like this with power very, very close to one, you still get this conclusion. But uh, certainly, I mean, well, after the UN, Nikolai and Noy or whoever exactly pointed out the mistake, Alan said that if you took a, if you were able to prove the result for some, um, for some uh, geometric series like this, then that would be helpful for uh, his argument for, for, for proving the cubics are well, approximable, and we certainly are very far from knowing anything like this. So this is this such an extension does hold. Let me also mention positive numbers since you asked about it. That extension holds, and this extension is not known. Is it, okay, is that? Yeah, thanks, thanks. I'll just, I'll, just, uh, I'll just make a box here so we can remember this. Um, all right. More questions? Okay. So theorem A is from uh, my paper with Elon Lindestrauss that um, Alan was citing, and the paper is from 2001, Ergodic Theory and Dynamical Systems, Section 6. And in fact, one of the reasons you know, that it's a good thing that, you know, Nicola asked me to give this lecture. I mean, this theorem is not stated exactly in this form in the paper, so it might be somewhat hard to, without reading a lot of the paper, you might not realize this is what's going on. So it's a good opportunity to, to state it in a, maybe a more convenient way. Um, so here is uh, this theorem. So now let uh, N be general, not necessarily uh, three, any number, at least two. Uh, ij, any two indices between one and n, distinct. Um, and then uh, let's choose L so that its orbit under the, the diagonal group is compact. I'll say a few words about this assumption in a moment. Uh, then um, uij l closure is equal to hl, where h is what's called an equiblock group, i.e., uh, there exists some k dividing in so that h equals. Uh, you take uh, a group which is made of block matrices. The blocks all have the same size K, so they're K by K blocks. And you take uh, determinant one matrices of this form. Not, not determinant one in each block, determinant one in total of, of this block matrix uh, up, to per, up to permuting indices. So this is... Uh, this is the more general statement that one can sort of find or infer from what's written in my paper with uh, Linden Strauss. So is this statement clear? Okay, so let me let me explain why this statement implies the Haynes lemma, lemma three. So theorem A, so I'm gonna be, spending most of the time explaining to you how to prove theorem A, but let's first see why it's stronger than what Alan Haynes was claiming. Theorem A implies Haynes lemma three. 
uh, uh, first we check that L in Haynes Lemma satisfies that AL is compact. So we're going to do this in a moment. Uh, now N, oh, I, one, sorry, one more thing I should have added to this statement in the general theorem. Um, the group H contains the group U, UIJ as well. That's another, it's another uh, consequence of the theorem. So uh, if N is three, that's what we get in, uh, in Haynes' situation, K can either be three or one, right? Because K has to define, divide N because these blocks, um, these blocks all have the same size and they, and, and the, in total you get an N by N matrix. So the only two cases are K equals three or K equals one. If K equals one, then H equals A. This just becomes, the, these just become one by one entries and this is just becomes the diagonal group. But the diagonal group doesn't satisfy this conclusion. So uh, we cannot have this, uh, we can't have this. So that means that uh, K equals three. And in that case, there's just one block. So in that case, H equals G. So what this is saying is that A L bar is G L, which is G mod gamma. Okay, so is this uh, derivation clear? Uh, Everybody's so super your, quiet. At, like, in, yeah. In your block structures, these blocks are just uh, uh, complete uh, groups, uh, J. Yeah, every block here, each block here um, has, is, is a matrix uh, of non-zero determinant and any matrix of non-zero determinant. Any matrix. And the only, uh, yeah, and the only um, condition is that the product of the determinants is equal to one because the, the total determinant should be equal to one. That's it, that's the only condition, but it's important. The sizes of the blocks are the same, okay? Okay. Any other questions? All right. And Haynes, uh, uh, if you, uh, some of you have read Haynes' uh, preprint carefully. So Haynes made a comment exactly about this, that the argument that I just gave would work. All that, that I'm using here is that, um, that at three is a prime number. So if uh, N is any prime number, same, same, same lemma would be true that Haynes formulates. And there, it's nothing to do with uh, the choice of i and j. It's going to work for every i and j. Um, all right, so let's look at this statement and uh, sort of get used to it a little bit. So first of all, there's this um, uh, condition here that uh, the orbit of L is compact under the group A, okay? so. You might think, is this a strong restriction or is this a, a weak restriction? And I just want to tell you, this is a very strong restriction. And typical orbits for the action, there's uh, every group that hit, that is unbounded. So, I mean, it's not a compact group, say. Every such group is acting ergodically on this space. So what that means is that typical orbits on this space for all sorts of groups are dense orbits because of ergodicity. So most of the orbits, almost every orbit for A is actually dense. It's certainly not compact. So this is a very, very restrictive condition. And you're going to see in a moment that uh, you get a very precise description of the lattices L for which uh, this uh, condition is satisfied. And in particular, it's going to be satisfied for these um, for orbits that look like this, so G0 times Zn, and orbits that look like this, the, the dual lattices of, of uh, G0 times Zn. So that's uh, something about 
uh, the assumption here. Uh, okay. The second thing I want you to notice Excuse me. is that the... Can you yeah. ask something? Yeah. Sure. So, 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 for instance, if n equals 4 and k equals 2, uh, HL yeah. uh, does not coincide with GL, right? It, it could. It depends on H. So in, in the case that you're uh -huh. mentioning, there's a third there's a uh -huh. third possibility. So that it's this possibility, two by two matrices. And in that case, they will, will not coincide. Uh -huh. so, so I mean, uh, no, notice that um, notice that uh, this right hand side, if it's equal to a closed set, that means it's a closed orbit. OK, so in other words, if H is not equal to G, then this right hand side is a manifold. It's a closed orbit for a Lie group. It's a manifold. Its dimension is the dimension of H. So it's certainly uh -huh. not equal to, to G mod gamma. It's some uh -huh. proper, very nice proper subset. If but, H is a proper but subset. UIJL uh, has always uh, to be uh, uh, dense, right? No. If I mean, no, I, mean, I, I mean, if if L is if AL is compact, no. No, 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 no. No. If, uh, oh, okay, if, okay, okay. If n if n has divisors, it might be or it might not be. Oh, okay, that, that's my question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um. Yeah. It depends on the. Um, it's an interesting. It, there's a lot of detail in the argument, and it depends on the um, fields, the structure of certain number field that's going to come up. Um whether or not it's a, you know, what the size of the blocks are. All right, so this is the theorem. Oh, another another thing I was about to say about this theorem is, so what is this conclusion here um, is saying that some group H has a closed orbit um, and some other group is has an orbit that's dense in this closed orbit. So as I just said, when I was answering all these questions, that means that this is a manifold in particular. And uh, for many groups uh, acting on homogeneous spaces, you might um, see orbit closures. This this kind of thing is called an orbit closure. We take a orbit under of L under UIJ and take the closure. So for some groups, these orbit closures could be strange sets. They might be fractals. They don't have to have to be manifolds. So this conclusion is quite strong in the sense that it's telling you that this orbit closure is actually a manifold. Uh, so this comes out of uh, the, the main engine for these kinds of results is Ratner's theorem, which you may have probably have all heard about at some point or another, but let me write down the statement again. So theorem A, everything I'm going to say today relies on Ratner's orbit closure theorem, which says the following. Uh, for any L in G mod gamma and any uh, group U generated by unipotent one parameter subgroups. I'll explain this in a moment. Uh, there is H so that um, U L bar equals H L. Uh, if L is G zero Z N, then uh, G zero H G zero inverse intersect um, S L N Z intersect gamma. Sorry. is a lattice in this group. And finally, U is contained in H. So this is uh, everything I've written down so far is this uh, Ratner's theorem. Let me explain some of the terminology here. So <clears throat> what are these unipotent one parameter subgroups? So a, a matrix is unipotent if all its eigenvalues are equal to one. And a, a group is unipotent one parameter subgroup if it is one parameter and made up of unipotent matrices. So the you know this example here, where did, where did it go? This example here is exactly 
an example of a unipotent group. But any group that's generated by such groups also is um, satisfies the hypothesis of Ratner's theorem. So it's a it's a very general result. It's, it um, applies to lots and lots of groups. In particular, it applies to our group U. And what this is saying is that for every orbit, closure is a nice geometric object. It's associated with some group H. And these are two conditions, this one and this one, are two further conditions that H must satisfy. So let me um, explain what these conditions are saying. This condition is more or less clear. That's just coming from the fact that this orbit is contained in this orbit, right? This orbit is the, the orbit on the right-hand side is the closure of the orbit on the left-hand side. In particular, this orbit is contained in this orbit and you can play with that a, a little bit and you obtain this inclusion, okay? So this inclusion is not that deep. This fact here says more about this nice manifold. It says that this man nice manifold is the support of a finite H invariant measure. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to exactly explain why this is the algebra um, behind it, but what this is saying is that if you take hard measure on H, uh, then this hard measure will um, give rise to a measure on this closed orbit, and that um, measure will be finite, finite and invariant under H. Okay, so this is Ratner's theorem, and uh, most of the work, we're using Ratner's theorem as a black box, and the work here is to identify, so theorem A identifies possible groups. H, uh, which arise for L, for which A L is correct. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the uh, logic of the proof. And uh, Oleg was asking earlier about replacing U. If, if U is one parameter, can we replace U just with positive numbers? And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes because it's already in Ratner's work. I mean, it's not any addition of my work with Lindenstrauss, this was also due to Ratner, that here you can also take, I'll write it down, can take UTL T positive if uh, you, if U is a one parameter group, you can just take positive, positive uh, one-sided, one half of the group if you like, and, and the same conclusion holds with the same group H. Okay, questions? So, and can you take here just uh, only integer values of t? You can take only integer values of t. Uh, then h might depend on the integer values. And so, in other words, what I'm saying is uh, for some, you know, you're taking an arithmetic progression, uh, there might be an arithmeticity condition. So the gap in the arithmetic progression could be rational or irrational with yeah. respect to some number, and that would change uh, the size of this group H, but that's all. So there's more you can say, which I'm not, uh, I'm not going into, but you can, yes, you, if you, if you, if you take arithmetic progressions in U, uh, Ratner tells you what you can get. It's, it's not a, the way I've stated it. You have to change slightly what I've said. For example, this, this might not hold anymore but uh, but certainly the rest of it will hold okay okay all right so what i'm going to what i want to do is i want to um, uh, prove this uh, theorem a I'm, I'm bringing it back up this is theorem a um and uh before I do that, I, I want to give you some examples of lattices satisfying this condition. And first I'll give you examples, and then I will actually tell you that these examples are all the examples up to, up to some small uh, tweaks. And uh, the structure of these examples is very important in the argument um, in, in this improving theorem A. So let's start with examples. 
So these are the Minkowski embeddings of totally real number field. Examples of L for which AL is compact. And I'll write Minkowski. This is just a geometric embedding. of orders in totally real number fields for people who know what that is, but I'm, I'm going to, to sort of say that in, in more detail. So let's start with a totally real number field of degree K, uh, N. And let's let uh, OK be the ring of integers. And let's let R in order. An order is just a um, uh, additive finite index subgroup of OK. All right, so uh, OK is a is a ring. It's it's um, it's an additive group and it's a ring under multiplication of numbers. And uh, you can just take an additive finite index subgroup, and that's called an order. And suppose R is spanned over Z by n numbers. Uh, again, it's rank n because it's finite index in OK, and OK is I didn't say it, but OK is of rank N as a group. Now let's let uh, sigma 1 be uh, the identity, sigma 2, sigma 3, up to sigma N be the field embeddings of K in R. R is totally real, so all the embeddings are into R. Uh, let's let... Uh, um, L be the splitting field. So I'm using two, uh, the letter L is used it being used twice, L for lattice and this fancier L is for a uh, Galois extension of uh, K. Uh, lambda, I'm going to denote by lambda the uh, the Agawa group of L and lambda K is elements of lambda, which fix everything in K. Act trivially on K. Um, you can think of uh, then, uh, I can, let me just say it in this in this way that the quotient. So this is a sub. This is a subgroup of lambda. So lambda over lambda k uh, is of cardinality n. Uh, let sigma one up to sigma n be uh, closely representative. So I'm using the same. I'm using the same letter sigma i for something that looks slightly different, but it's really not different. If you take this field embedding, uh, the image of this field embedding belongs to L, and actually this field, these field embeddings all uh, can be extended to uh, elements of this Galois group, field automorphisms of L in a non-unique way, but they're unique up to, um, I mean, they, they only differ by elements of this group. And so if you like, you can think of these um, field embeddings as being the restrictions of these coset representatives to K. Is that clear? It's just a technical point. So I'll, maybe I'll write it down just, let, let's just add a bar here. And sigma i is just the restriction of sigma bar i 
Okay. Um, and um, a unit in a totally in the ring of integers is an element uh, so that its inverse is also an integer, an algebraic integer. And equivalently, its norm, oops, sorry. This plus minus one. And this uh, um, and uh, notation of all the units. It's the multiplicative group of the ring of, of the ring of integers. So these are the invertible elements in the in the uh, ring of integers. And for such theta, I'm going to define a diagonal group element, a theta, to be oops, sorry. I just take the different uh, images of theta under the field embeddings, and I put them in a diagonal matrix. Diagonal matrix. And I'm claiming, so this is a diagonal matrix. It might, it won't have uh, determinant one. It might have determinant negative one. Let's just ignore that point. If the determinant is negative one, you you you, you look at sigma squared and now the determinant becomes one. Okay, so that's just a fine point. But this is a diagonal matrix essentially belonging to A. And uh, let's let G zero be the matrix that I mentioned before when I wrote down Haynes's result. This is uh, this matrix. So again, I multiply it by constant C so that it's um, uh, det got determinate one. And now I'm claiming that, um, well, let, let's, 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 let's erase this constant first and then we'll add it in later. Let's look at, G0, Zn. What is G0, Zn? By definition, it's the span, as a lattice, it's the span over Z of the columns of this matrix. So the columns of this matrix are uh, all the, uh, this is called it the Minkowski, the vectors arising from the Minkowski embedding of alpha one and then the Minkowski embedding of alpha two, et cetera. And since we're taking a span over Z, which means we're taking Z integer combinations, uh, which, and the sigma i's are group, are uh, field automorphisms. And so this is the same as taking uh, all the, um, all the Minkowski ge uh, geometric embeddings of all the vectors, of all the numbers in R, okay? So this is G0, Zn, and C0, Zn is the same lattice rescaled to have covolume equal to one. And now I'm claiming that these diagonal matrices, if I act with these diagonal matrices by linear transformations on this lattice or on this lattice, which is the same, then this may, these, these elements um, keep the lattice fixed. They move the vector space around, but they send the lattice to itself. So let's let's verify that. That's maybe the first important observation here, we get this lattice to have lots of stabilizers 
which are elements of the diagonal group. Here's the computation. Um, suppose uh, theta fixes R, then uh, A theta C G0N. C is just a scalar, I could pull it out. Um, Put it out front. And because, uh, let me rewrite this, uh, let me rewrite this as a, as a diagonal matrix. Because of the way uh, diagonal matrices uh, multiply vectors, this is just this. Okay. Uh, in other words, when I do the matrix multiplication, this gets multiplied by this which gives me sigma one theta times sigma one X, but sigma one is a field automorphism, so it looks like that. And similarly in every, uh, in every entry. And so this is um, C times G zero DN. So what, what I've shown you is that this element stabilizes this lattice. So this lattice has a big stabilizer in the diagonal group. I hope that's clear. Any questions about this little calculation? So let's continue then. So there's a there's something called the Dirichlet unit theorem. The unit theorem says that this uh, group of units contains n minus one multiplicatively independent um, elements. In other words, it's a, i.e., an abelian group. Free uh, 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 torsion free abelian group rank n minus one. Um, and um, And this, 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 uh, where is this? This embedding is kind of a strange embedding. It's taking numbers in a number field and making diagonal matrices out of them, but it's a, uh, it's an algebra automorphism. In other words, it maps multiplication to multiplication. It maps addition to, to addition. So it's giving us a ring uh, isomorphism between uh, the algebraic integers and these, diag these particular diagonal matrices. And so what all of this is saying is that the stabilizer, the stabilizer of this matrix in the diagonal group is co-compact in the diagonal group. So we got the compact orbit. So this is sometimes called uh, the norm torus construction. If you in, in number in the number theory or the algebraic groups uh, literature, this is called the norm torus. So these are this is a way to find compact orbits for the diagonal group on the space of lattices. Questions about this? Um, so the second 
statement is that this is actually if and only if. So this is essentially the only way to get compact orbits in a diagonal group. So that's what I want to, to prove next. All, all, all um, uh, uh, compact orbits for the diagonal group acting on the space of lattices um, arise from this kind of construction. So let me state this essentially. So I'll just state something more precise than what I just said. So proposition, oops, sorry which is the converse to this construction. Um, suppose L is an element in the space of lattices with a compact orbit under the group A. Um, Then there's a Galois field, L, um, oops, I'm sorry. So a priori, we don't know the, we don't know the shape of G here that represents this lattice. So I'm just gonna call it G and I'm going to claim that G actually is the same as the previous G zero up to some simple modifications. So then there's a Galois field L and um, an element G zero, which is an invertible matrix with coefficients in this um, Galois field. Uh, satisfying the following things, G zero, G inverse, is diagonal and therefore um, uh, G inverse A G equals G zero inverse A G inverse and four sub C. Um, C, G, zero, and so. So uh, the, the main conclusion here is this, this matrix is diagonal and you can check that that implies that this conjugation these two conjugations of A by these two elements are the same. And it also means that as a set, if you uh, look at the matrices in A multiplied by this element G, it's the same as the matrices in A multiplied by C times G zero, where G zero, where, where C is some constant. This is again up to maybe flipping, making the determinant negative or positive, which is a point that I want to not spend too much time on. So this is, uh, the first item here. The second item is that if you look at the Galois group of this field extension, remember this is a Galois extension, it permutes the rows of G0 transitively. What does this mean? Well, G0 is a matrix, n by n matrix with coordinates in L. So if you apply a Galois automorphism to all the um, to all the entries, you get a new matrix. And what this is saying is when you do that to G0, what the field automorphism is going to do, to do is it's going to permute the rows. That's all it's going to do. It's going to permute the rows and it's going to permute them transitively, meaning you can take any row to any other row by an appropriate element of the Galois group. And the next item is, if you take a diagonal matrix with um, rational coefficients and you let lambda act on the conjugate of A by G0, Um, 
Again, it permutes rows. Again, transitively. Okay, so this these are the um, these are the this is the, the precise statement. I don't um, quite understand, yeah. uh, uh, but there's this uh, uh, how can we call it? Castle Swinnerton Dyer Margulis conjecture, right? Right, and uh, how is it connected to, to to the statement? So these in the castles. Castle Swinton Dyer Margulis conjecture is about orbits under the diagonal group, which whose closure is compact. In other words, they're bounded ah, in the space okay. of lattices. No, and I'm good. just Thank describing you. those mm -hmm. for which the orbit itself is compact, not not it its is, closure. It is compact itself. Good. Okay. It's compact itself exactly. Yeah. And the uh, conjecture just says that there are no uh, other examples. In other words, the conjecture, another way of saying the conjecture is if a lattice has a orbit which is bounded in the space of lattices, then, it's then the, or, the orbit is already compact. Okay? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, any other questions? All right. It might not be at all clear from everything that I've said uh, why I'm calling this a converse. It just looks like some very technical statement about matrices which have this property, okay? But I never actually said, where, where, where was it? I never actually said that the matrix looks like this. So I am actually saying that the matrix looks like this. Let me explain why. And so, um, first of all, what the first item says is that uh, if I have a lattice which has a compact orbit and it's obtained by applying G to Zn, it's also obtained by applying C times G0 to Gn because of this statement. So I'm allowed to replace G by C times G0. Okay, and C is a scalar, so it, it uh, jumps across A. I mean, it commutes with A, so it really doesn't play much of a role in what happens. And so I'm allowed to actually replace G with G0. That's what the first item is saying, if I want to understand all the lattices which have a, which are, have a compact orbit. Now, why does this G0 satisfying this information, why is it, um, where, is it where did this go? Why does it look like this, you might ask? Well, let's see what this is saying. So, um, first thing that this is saying is that the Galois group is acting on the rows and permutes them transitively. So in other words, you take one row, say the first row, let's, let's call the first row, um, let's denote, Maybe I'll move to uh, to this color here. So, for oops, first row is sigma one alpha one sigma one alpha. And, uh, sorry, sigma one. Ah, uh, sorry. I wanted to do this without black, so I don't destroy. But I'll do it in black. So if alpha one up to alpha n equals sigma one alpha one. Remember that sigma one is the identity on K. Sigma one alpha n is first row. If I just call that the first row of this matrix, then all the, that what this formula is saying that all the other rows are obtained from this first row by applying the other Galois um, elements. So the other, um, the other rows are obtained by applying lambda. And so, and in fact, uh, so here we, we see that, where do we go? Here we see that the first row in this matrix consists of elements from the number field L and the other rows are obtained from that first row using the same, um, using this uh, recipe. And moreover, since the determinant of G0 
um, is non-zero. So that's, uh, we get this from here. That means that actually these different, uh, that the, the, the elements in this row actually have to generate K. They have to span K. They can't span a proper subset because that otherwise we would get a determinant that's equal to zero. So in fact, these elements must, um, where, did, where did this go? I'm sorry for flipping back and forth. I just, these elements here, the first row here, have to generate the number field. Well, they don't generate algebraic integers and they don't generate perhaps an order, but they generate the number field. Well, but then algebraic numbers can be multiplied by a common factor to make them all algebraic integers. So if you multiply them all by a sufficiently large compact factor, you can make all of these simultaneously to be um, uh, algebraic integers. And therefore you sort of arrive at this uh, at this description, at the same description that we had before. Okay, so uh, I, I'm not writing it down, but let me leave that as an exercise maybe. Exercise proposition implies all compact A orbits arise as in the example. Uh, let's prove this. Uh, so this actually is, in some sense, the main technical statement that I want to prove. So let's prove this uh, statement. Oops. <clears throat> so I'm going to conjugate A by G. So what is that? Why, why do I do these conjugations? Well, remember that... Uh, that uh, so I'll write, I'll write everything down. So a zero z n. This is the same as g inverse a g z n, which is the same as um, uh, g inverse applied to a l, which is compact. Right. We assumed. But this is compact. It's a compact set. We're taking a compact set and applying a, an element to it, a homeomorphism to it. We get a new compact thing. So the orbit of the, this conjugation has the uh, advantage that it uh, transfers the orbit here, which we know is compact, to this orbit here, which is an orbit of Zn, which is a lattice that we understand better under a different group. It's not the same group we had before, it's the conjugated group. Okay, so this is kind of a standard trick in this homogeneous dynamics business. Any, up to a conjugation, any orbit you wanna think about, you can think about it as being the orbit of Zn. The group, the group will have to change when you do that. So that's the first thing we do. Um, and so this is a compact orbit. And so the stabilizer, which is uh, the intersection of SL and Z, with a zero this is the stabilizer of zn inside this group this is co-compact in a zero um so and it the the, the group is an abelian group it's essentially rn minus one so what does it mean that it's there? And so that means that you can find an element in there with distinct eigenvalues. Uh, let's let this L be the splitting field. Oops. Or the characteristic polynomial. Of, of uh, this gamma. Uh, claim P gamma is an irreducible polynomial over Q. Okay. 
Let's prove this claim. If a, if a integer matrix um, if it has a has a um, minimal has a characteristic polynomial which is not irreducible, then its action on Euclidean space is not irreducible over Q. So that means that there exists a rational space, uh, a proper rational space. V, um, which is invariant under this matrix. Um, now, how many invariant um, subspaces are there for finitely many or only finitely many? Invariant subspaces for gamma because of distinct eigenvalues. And uh, A0 can use with gamma. So A0 permutes them, permutes these finitely many spaces. But A0 is connected. So connected group. So A0 has to fix this um, group V. And A0, so, um, so gamma zero in A0 is so compact. And um, gamma zero preserves uh, v, v intersected Zm, because gamma zero consists of in integer matrices that are invertible over integers. And so this implies that for all A in gamma zero, the determinant of A restricted to V is plus minus one. So this means that for because uh, gamma zero is co-compact, for all A in A0, the determinant of A restricted to V is actually one. So compact in, uh, in A0 is connected. So this means that the dimension, so we found a function, a homomorphism, so that A0 is contained in its kernel, but this means that the dimension of A0 is at most N minus two, but we, we know that the dimension of a zero is n minus one, so we got a contradiction. Okay, let, let me let me sort of very very quickly, just to, without going on into all the details, explain the logic again. So a zero is defined here. The dimension of a is n minus one, and we're just conjugating a. So the dimension of a zero is also uh, n minus one, and the con condition that these are n by n diagonal matrices. So it's dimension n, but we have to reduce one because we're assuming that the determinant is equal to one. So that ends up being uh, one restriction on this group. Now, if uh, P gamma were not irreducible, we're finding another function, a different function, which is this function, which vanishes or which has a constant value on this group A. It's another homomorphism. So that reduces the dimension even further, and that gives us our contradiction. So I've proved to you that uh, P gamma is uh, irreducible. So uh, now what that means now is that, um, uh, so, this is, so this proves the claim. By the claim, uh, the, the, the Galois group, lambda, acts transitively on the eigenvalues of gamma. 
right? P gamma is P gamma was the um, was the characteristic polynomial, but now it's irreducible, so it's the minimal polynomial. So it's the minimal polynomial of each and every one of these eigenvalues, and so this Galois group permutes all these zeros of this polynomial. So it permutes the um, it permutes all uh, transitively permutes the eigenvalues of this matrix gamma. Um, so let's let uh, let's write uh, the eigenvalues as theta one up to theta n. So I'm diagonalizing. Uh, I, I now know that the eigenvalues are different. I diagonal. I assume they're different. I diagonalize. I know that I can diagonalize with this element G that's just coming out of this uh, uh, formula right here. So uh, gamma belongs to A0, and that means that this conjugation puts me in G. So this is the, just the diagonalization of gamma. And theta i's all belong to L. And so uh, if I write out, I'm going to write down this formula, the previous formula in this way, I've just rewritten the previous line. Uh, but here, what this means is if I think of the uh, rows of G, uh, and I think of gamma as acting by right multiplication on the rows of G, then this just means that the rows of G are eigenvectors. The row rows of G are eigenvectors for left multiplication. Um, and um, so in particular, if uh, V1 is the first row of G, then C1, so that C1, V1 belongs to uh, the field generated by the eigenvalue. Right. If you have an eigenvector of an integer matrix, uh, the you can you can scale it so that its entries belong to the field generated by rational numbers adjoined the eigenvalue. So I can multiply v1 by a constant and put it a non-zero constant and put it in this form. And since uh, lambda permutes. Uh, the vi, sorry, the the uh, theta i. Uh, there are so the same thing holds for every i. So there are c i so that um, c i, oops, c i v i is in q theta i to the n. Uh, c i v i. Are all eigenvectors for left multiplication. So what we're getting is that um, if we let G0 be um, the matrix whose rows are these CIVIs, then G0 belongs to this um, matrices with entries in this number field L, and uh, the VIs are linearly independent because we're getting all the uh, eigenvalues and this matrix is diagonalizable. And uh, this is the same as saying that G0 is C1 Cn times G. So if you look at uh, everything that we've said in the statement, uh, it now follows. So in other words, we've proved that 
um, G0, G inverse is this matrix of CIs that I wrote down. It's a diagonal matrix. We've proved that this uh, Galois group permutes the rows. And this follows um, for every rational matrix because the way the rational matrix is acting on the number field L. So, okay, I'll, I'll leave the third point for you to think about, but it's it's easy from here. Um, okay, so I've proved the, uh, I've proved the proposition and now I wanna prove, any questions about this? Now I'm ready to prove the theorem, but are there questions about this proposition? Okay, and no questions, so let me let me continue. Yeah. I'm just asking if there are any questions, probably no questions, so you're- you oh, may... okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's continue to the proof of theorem A. So let, let me just remind you what I've done so far. So. This was theorem A, where did it go? <clears throat> this was theorem A. We're taking uh, a particular group, this UIJ group, and we're proving that if the lattice has a compact orbit, we already now, we now know from the proposition what that means that the lattice has a compact orbit. Um, we're proving that the orbit closure looks like these equiblock groups for some K block size dividing N. Um, and we know from Ratner's theorem, we're going to use Ratner's theorem. We know from Ratner's theorem that the orbit closure is uh, given by some group uh, satisfying various properties. So now we're going to use what we have to to show that the that the group is actually this equiblock has this equiblock structure. Um, so. of this theorem A. Okay, this is this is Ratner's theorem, as I said. Now uh, we got this, uh, uh, so let A sub L be elements of A, such that AL equals L by assumption AL is co-compact in A. Let's think about how these elements act on H, on the, this group H. So Ratner gives us a group H and how does it interact with uh, the group A? A priori, uh, we haven't, there's, you know, there's no relation a priori between A and H. I mean, H is given by this U orbit, but, uh, this L is special, it has a compact orbit under the diagonal group. So we're gonna use that now. And so uh, HL is UIJL bar. Uh, that's how we got H. Um, let's take an element that preserves L. So I can insert it here. Now A, uh, the, the diagonal, the by the group by the uh, group A. So this is the same as this. Okay, I flipped the order here. And the reason is that A normalizes. This group. Uh, a is just acting as a homeomorphism. So if I take, I'm taking the closure of the entire thing, it's the same as taking the closure of this and then applying A. And this is again, A times H L. And this is the same as A H, A inverse L. Again, because A, A and A inverse fix L. So what have I gotten? I've gotten that this, um, equals that. And we're in a uh, homogeneous space. So locally, uh, these objects look like corresponding objects in the group G. So in other words, uh, if I start at a point in my homogeneous space, this L, and I move along H, that's the same as moving along AHA inverse. 
Uh, H is a connected group. It's determined by its tangent space. And this is showing us that the tangent space is the same. So I'll just write it this way, considering tangent spaces. Uh, and ah, I should have said H is connected. I Sorry, this is one of the conclusions of uh, Ratner's theorem. Uh, H is connected, and this implies that A H A inverse equals H. Let me let me add connectedness to the conclusion of Ratner's theorem. It's part of her work. I mean, I'm, uh, these notes are going to be available later, so we might as well make them make them nice. So H is connected. Um, okay, so. So we got this fact that A normalizes H, which is already a lot of information. Um, in other words, uh, A L is co-compact in all of A. So then we get that all of A normalizes H. Um, the conjugation of um, uh, yeah, the conjugation of um, so let's let h zero the same trick as before h zero is going to be g zero inverse h g zero so oops sorry. So that means that H zero Z N um, H zero intersect S L N C is a lattice in H zero. Remember, this was one of the conclusions of Ratner's theorems, and uh, so for. A in uh, A L. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, something's confusing me here. Just a second. Well, what I want to conclude is that, um, yeah, we're, I'm getting a little bit tired and maybe I'm missing something. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it as an exercise. It's a conjugation. So exercise, conclude from this, that conjugation by A preserves um, the volume on this group, H0. In other words, uh, we had this kind of argument earlier, but in an abelian situation, if you're conjugating a, um, we have this, when we were thinking about the conjugation on this, sorry, the action on this uh, space V that came up in the lemma. So uh, in that space, we were looking at the determinant of A restricted to that thing, but that thing was rational and we're acting here by integer matrices and these are integer matrices. And from that, you can conclude that the conjugation doesn't affect the volume on this group. Okay, now here's another exercise which um, follows from this. H zero looks like a block group. So this is just something about, but the blocks at this point don't have to be of the same size, A1, A2, AR. Um, so exercise these kinds of groups are the groups normalized by A such that conjugation by a doesn't 
change their volume. Um, maybe I'll say a little bit, a few words about that exercise in a, in a moment, but let's just assume it and continue. So we, we're almost done. We have that H0 is made of blocks, but we haven't seen that the blocks are of equal size. You can see that the blocks of our equal size, let uh, um, S, S0 be the, uh, um, um, sorry, let, let's let, let's not call it S0. Let's let uh, uh, gamma zero or A zero be a diagonal matrix in H zero with uh, um, equal entries in each block and rational entries. Um, once we have such a matrix, then uh, A0 is central in H0, and H0 is the centralizer of A0. But now applying the proposition um, to G0, A0, G0 inverse, we see that the rows of A0 transitively. So that means that A0 has blocks of the same size. So that means that H0, which is the centralizer of A0, has blocks of the same size. And that finishes the proof. So again, I'll just say a few words and then I'll conclude. So um, we had the uh, proposition that I want to recall for you. Where did it go? This is the proposition. And the last item of the proposition, you take a diagonal matrix and it has rational entries and you let the Galois group act on this conjugate. Uh, it's acting on it just by affecting, th this is, these are matrices that have coefficients in L and you're just letting the uh, Galois group act coefficient by coefficient. And the claim here was that uh, it's just permuting the rows and it's, it can send any row to any other row. Now we're taking A0, a very special matrix. The matrix that we're taking, um, is a matrix that commutes with H0. So it's got a scalar matrix here, another scalar matrix here, et cetera, et cetera. And these scalar matrices, uh, since they're scalar matrices, you can recover H0 from this element. It's exactly the centralizer, namely all the matrices that commute. If, if, if the scalar here is different, if, if the scalar in each block, if all these scalars are different scalars, then H0 is exactly the centralizer of A0. So if you know A0, you know H0. Well, the Galois group is acting transitively on the rows of A0. So if you have K1 scalars, which are equal here, the number of scalars that are equal here should also be K1 because the Galois group preserves this partition into, um, into uh, blocks of same size. And that means that the blocks of H0 should be the same. And I'll, I'll, I want to say one more word again about uh, why we've reached this block form and why I was interested in preserving the volume. Uh, to say that A normalizes H, what that means is essentially, I'll just make some doodle, I'll do some, some uh, doodling down here. So A preserves, 
Suppose we just know that A preserves, normalizes, I'm sorry, normalizes. The group H, what does that mean? That means that H uh, is of the form Uh, it's got some, you know, if you have, uh, it's a di it's algebra is a direct sum of EIJs that I had before. In other words, if you have some matrix in some location here, by conjugations, you can increase or decrease this number and you can reach, so the, the, the group sort of splits as being made up of, um, um, yeah, I'll just write it down. Then the Lie algebra, I don't know how people are used to Lie algebra notation, but the Lie algebra of H is a sum over some ij's of these gij's. Gij is the uh, Lie algebra of this group uij that I had before. So that just follows from conjugation. An example would be uh, these, this block group that I had before. But another example might be the group UIJ itself. If I have this kind of a group, this could be an example. This is normalized by A, but this is not a block group. What's the difference? The difference is that the diagonal group, uh, when you act on such a group, uh, some elements of the diagonal group contract this or expand this. They don't leave the volume invariant. If you wanna leave the volume invariant, whenever you see something here, you should see something uh, on the other, on the in the, in the transpose matrix as well, it, with the same uh, weight, so that you end up um, not affecting the volume. In other words, if I conjugate, the volume here increases, the volume here decreases by the same amount, and in some total, the volume of the group doesn't change. So the fact that the volume doesn't change implies that the group uh, has this uh, special form up to permuting the indices. Which, which I guess, uh, which I used here. All right, I hope this was more or less clear. Happy to answer questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting and very useful talk, I think, for most of us. <laughs> so any questions? I want to ask uh, just one question or one comment. Maybe it is stupid and I do not know whom mm -hmm. I should answer it, but if you can show this, the, the beginning with uh, 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 this uh, matrix uh, and simple, uh, a simple uh, 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 unipotent flow, which was used in three by, for three by three matrix. If you can show this moment, Yes, in, in the in in, uh, in the very beginning. So so look, we are applying this U, this U mm -hmm. to uh, 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 algebraic lattice, and we right. deal with a, a set of parameters T. So, uh, uh, so I am asking, so so Barak or Alek. So if we just consider a sequence of uh, matrices U for some T's, which say go to zero. And we consider this part of orbit of uh, lattice. Is it true that this uh, uh, subsequence uh, goes into cusp in the space of lattices? With T is going to zero? No, if T is going to zero, then this matrix is going to the identity. And then this trajectory is just going to this fixed lattice L. So it's not going anywhere interesting. Yeah, well, well, well. Uh, I'm looking, yes, yes. Uh, uh, mm. No, the question is about probably the norm minimum. So- But the, if the, the norm minimum, uh, is the, the norm minimum close to zero, then-, then Closeness uh, to the, the cusp. Right, the norm, you can make the norm minimum go to zero by applying elements t here but they're not necessarily t's which are close to zero they're some t's i'll i'll show you something very very simple okay so uh let me show you something very very simple so if you know if if um 
If L, the lattice, contains a non zero vector uh, V with um, uh, one coefficient coefficient of V equal to zero, then the norm of V is zero, and so the or minimum of L is zero, right? You agree? Yes, of course. So let's look at uh, any V. And suppose Vn, if Vn is zero, then of course uh, the norm of thing is zero. That's by what we just said. If Vn is not zero, uh, let's apply this. Uh, unipotent. We can make the zero. You can put group. Yes. You can put it on the. Yeah. So, so then what you get in the microphone. next here you get v n minus one plus t v n right. Yes. And yes. here you get some other yes, stuff. Yes. And so now you choose t to be whatever it needs to be. So um, minus v n minus one over v n, and then you get uh, that. Uh, and so the norm of this particular, um, you know, this particular image is the norm minimum is zero. So but this is a special T. Of does. course, you can do that. You can play this trick it's again kind of... and again and again using different uh, vectors. And you get lots of T's for which the norm minimum is zero. It's a kind of a, 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 a like trivializing simplification of the principle of uh, 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 isolation yeah yeah yes this this is this is uh, the, this yeah. the example so, of trivialized isolation principle yes 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 yes, <laughs> yes. this is in our in the paper with Lyndon Charles we exactly use the same trick and I think also this trick appears in the castles and what Nikolai meant was, uh, uh, suppose T is bounded by some small epsilon, yeah. then the smaller epsilon is, and T is arbitrary uh, in between zero and epsilon. The, the smaller the uh, chosen epsilon is, the closer to, to the cusp will be all the lattices with, with between zero and epsilon. No, I mean, let's be careful. It's, to say that the norm minimum is zero doesn't mean that the lattice itself is close to the cusp. From a diagonal Means orbit. Yeah, if, something from if diagonal you apply orbit. the diagonal orbit. Yes. Yes. So what you're asking, so, actually talking about is the orbit of the lattice under two groups at the same time, the diagonal group and this unipotent group. And, and you're absolutely right. This argument is showing you that there are that there are no orbits whatsoever that stay bounded under this action of these two groups together. The, the group generated by these two groups always takes you to the cusp for this very simple reason. But uh, yeah, that's and I as I said that observation already can be found in Castles and Sonnen and Dyer. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, of course. There's one thing I forgot to tell you about. Um, I, everybody's quiet, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll just say it. I, I, did, I didn't talk about, I forgot to mention uh, this uh, inverse transpose business. So, I mean, I, I showed you why these matrices give a compact orbit under the diagonal group, but it, I didn't show why these, why you're allowed to take an inverse Um, let's write that down here because that's it's a nice thing. I mean, uh, inverse transpose is well known in geometry of numbers as taking the dual lattice in these homogeneous spaces. Um, the map, this map, uh, inverse transpose. Uh, sends uh, G to G, of course. It sends SLNZ to SLNZ, right? I mean, if you take a matrix with 
integer coefficients and determinant one, its inverse still has integer coefficients determinant one, and so does its inverse transpose. It takes diagonal uh, elements to diagonal elements. And so if uh, L equals G zero Z N, so, so um, it has a compact A orbit, Uh, then so does uh, G zero inverse transpose Zn, right? I mean, this fact, um, this fact shows you that this map gives you a automorphism of the space, right? It maps G to G preserving gamma. So it induces a map of G mod gamma. And this map is, you know, it's a home, it's invertible, it's continuous, so it's a homeomorphism. So we're getting a homeomorphism that um, of the quotient. So maybe I'll write that down here. Just I'll make more space. Sorry. Sorry. So this induces a homeo. And since it commutes with, since it maps A to A, this homeo sends A orbits to A orbits. And in particular, it says, and it, so it sends compact A orbits to compact A orbits because it's a homeomorphism. So in particular, it sends uh, this compact A orbit of this lattice to the compact, to the, to the orbit of this lattice, which is there, therefore is also compact. So this is kind of a group theoretic proof that if you have a lattice that's got a compact orbit under the diagonal group, so that's its um, dual lattice. Of course, there are many, many other proofs and they're all more or less simple, but uh, it's just worth seeing the proof from this point of view. There's a lot of stuff that goes under the name of kin chain transference principle, et cetera, et cetera, that in the um, homogeneous dynamics um, formalism, uh, basically correspond to using this map, the inverse transpose map. So, but it seems to topic. me that, 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 that this argument, it gives something, uh, it gives some statement concerning uh, uh, compactness. So it, it um, Kinchin's transference or, or, or anything like that, it deals with, uh, uh, with, ex with exponents and uh, co compactness Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is more about like, you're right. It's more about um, yeah, being badly approximable. Exactly. So can, uh, transference is more is more precise. I have to charge my battery. I'll be back in one second. Oh, sorry, my my computer is about to go dead. One second. Oh, okay, so I think I think very. Very useful lecture, I think. So <laughs> we, we should be happy. Useful indeed. <laughs> so, but, but but I hope we will continue with uh, recovering isolation theory once. I have a, another question, actually, a, a slightly off-topic one, if Bara can hear wonderful, me. Wonderful. Okay, Alec, Alec, you you are welcome. Okay, uh, but I have yeah. a slightly off-topic question. Look, yeah. uh, 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 concerning those algebraic lattices. So yeah. uh, we know that the Galois group uh, at simply saying changing the order of coordinates, right? Mm -hmm. uh, were you ever interested in uh, such lattices that are say invariant under the action of some elements of the, the Galois group. So so that they have additional symmetries yeah. uh, uh, apart from those provided by the Richley's theorem. So you want uh, more, um, some subgroup of the Galois group is, is, is the symmetries. Yes, okay. some, some non-trivial subgroup to, to, to Preserve the lattice. Um, 
I mean, it's obviously an interesting question, but uh, yeah, I think, for example, there's this paper of Linus Strauss and Shapira, Uri Shapira and, and Elon Strauss have a paper. You could ask, what happens if you relax the condition that uh, the number field is totally real? If the number field has a few real embeddings, but not it's not totally real, then you get a smaller um, group of units. The rank of the group of units is the number of real embeddings. Yes, yes, yes. And so that's going to give you uh, a bunch of uh, diagonal uh, self maps, automorphisms coming from diagonal elements coming from um, units in this uh, ring of integers, but it's not going to give you independent uh, n minus one independent uh, automorphisms like this, just a smaller number. But you can still do something with it, uh, in, in in some cases. But that's uh, that's basically the only place that I've seen this kind of uh, analysis. Actually, uh, uh, this st st student of mine and I, we had a couple of papers uh, where mm -hmm. we actually uh, considered such lattices, and uh, it is uh, uh, it kind of. Funny fact that 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 in the two-dimensional case, uh, it is equivalent to asking uh, if the period of the quadratic rationality is symmetric, say a palindrome. Oh yeah, oh really? Oh yeah. yes, Alec has interesting papers in higher dimension about mm -hmm. palindromicity of something. <laughs> so some extra symmetries apart from those provided by by. Dirichlet's theorem, and they uh -huh. happen to be very nicely connected with, with the action of the Galois group, actually, in the three-dimensional case, in, in the simplest non-trivial non case. That's interesting. So send me the... So these are like uh, symmetries of the quotient... Uh, symmetries of what, exactly? So, so you kind of... Uh, uh, cyclically change the coordinates. Right. If uh, if the uh, dimension is three, right, and uh, our Galois group has only three elements, then we just consider such a cyclic <clears throat> uh, shift, mm -hmm. right? And uh, sometimes it preserves the lattice. I see. And this looks very nicely, actually. Send me the papers. I'll take a look. I think it. Oh, uh, by the way, to, uh, uh, Alec Shapiro. Shapiro have, has some examples that might be related. I I have an idea. Maybe you will give a talk at our the the seminar about uh, properties of lattice and symmetries because not too much people know about this. Once. Why not? Why not? Sounds good. Okay, thank you for the very nice. Sure, very sure. Thank you very much. Yes. So, Nicola, if people are interested in these notes, you can send me emails, and I'll just share these. Uh, share oh. these. Notes okay, I think I think we will put something at our site. Uh, at our uh, but, but, well, well, but may, maybe notes are also be useful for for this purpose. Okay, Barks, thank you very much. In any case, sure. I, I think it was it should be very interesting for, for our people. So thank you very much. Okay. No thank problem. You. Take care. Thank you. Bye, oh, everybody. Okay, good. Let, let, let us have a break. Okay, thank you, Barak. Okay. Oh no, Alex, you see, they. Очень, мне довольно тяжело следить, понимаете, хотя я этот уже больше года слушаю этот семинар. Ну вот да, там вот, особенно ну, та, та часть, которая вот ближе к концу была, там, там, ну он быстро говорит, понимаете, то есть если уже это в какой-то мере, там, может быть, с другой стороны, знаешь, то все равно тяжело, можно... все равно тяжело, я Но тут... Тяжело. <связь> они, видите, алгебраически мыслят. Они какие-то даже не алгебраические, да, они да, да. делают мне эти приходится... сопряж... мне... <связь> мне приходилось постоянно как синхронному переводчику переводить все. Да, конжугацию, конжугацию сделают, что-то делают. А это очень похоже на то, что мы, мы делаем. Вот на то, что 
Понимаете, поэтому мне кажется, очень уместно выступление, если вы произведете про теорему изоляции. Кон конжугация это всего, это всего лишь вот то, что мы делаем. Ну, давайте рассмотрим гиперболический поворот, который сажает там точку на бисектрису угла. Нет, но вот это нет, я вот это имел в виду G, H, G в минус первый. Вот, вот эти вот классы он рассматривает. Нет, я... Ну, хорошо, да. да. Ладно, смотрю, ну, в общем, как... все, равно, все равно ты в этих терминах не мыслил. Если тебя в детстве научили, я пришел к такому выводу, если тебя в детстве научили мыслить так, ты будешь мыслить так, понимаете? По-своему. Ладно, наша компания... Это, в общем, да. Ладно. Вообще, по-моему, очень Все, я полезно. Я поехал на поезд. Послушать, по-моему, очень полезно. Спасибо, да, очень полезно. Только, только мне, к сожалению, уже нужно ехать на поезд. Хорошо, но мы с вами тогда потом договоримся, потому что изоляцию да. хорошо. Да. Я да. думаю, что хорошо. Вообще хорошо. Изоляцию разберем, хорошо.